<laughs> you know what? Fuck Batman Begins. I mean, I know I never said fuck Batman, or fuck Batman Returns, or fuck Batman Forever, or even fuck Batman and Robin, but I am saying fuck Batman Begins. Why am I saying that? Because Batman Begins should have been a great movie. And I expected to see a great movie when I went to see Batman Begins. In fact, when I saw Batman Begins the first time, and I walked out of the theater thinking, wow, that was kind of shitty, I went back and saw it a second time because I wondered what I was missing. Everybody loved Batman Begins, especially Batman fans. They loved Batman Begins. It, 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 to this day, there are still some people who like Batman Begins even more than The Dark Knight which I think is just fucking insane. Is it as bad as uh, Batman and Robin? Oh, God, no. Is it as bad as Batman Forever? Of course not. And it's also, I'll tell you what, it's better than Batman and Batman Returns. It is. But that is what is known, my friends, as damning with faint praise. And I think that I can pinpoint who is at fault for the failure, what I feel is the failure of Batman Begins. And it's not Christopher Nolan, who is a damn good director. He's made uh, some just amazing films. Memento is a great movie. His American remake of Insomnia is a really good movie. The Dark Knight is fucking phenomenal. Inception, I don't care what anybody says, Inception was a fucking great movie. Uh, Nolan is amazing. He's a terrific director. It's also not Christian Bale's fault. Uh, when, when Batman Begins first premiered, uh, someone in a review said that Christian Bale playing Batman is the first time that it has mattered who was in the Batsuit. And I think that's completely true. Michael Caine is Alfred. <sighs> you know, it's like, wow, what a great idea. Why didn't anybody think of that before? That's great. Morgan Freeman is Lucius Fox. It's like, do you really want Morgan Freeman to play Lucius Fox? He's like barely even a supporting character. But there he is. And they remake him into like Batman's version of James Bond's Q. You know, he's, he's the gadget guy instead of just being the guy who is black and runs Bruce Wayne's company. Liam Neeson, one of the greatest actors with a bad script that there has ever been. He can do more with nothing than any other actor I've ever seen. Uh, great cast. You notice why? You notice I haven't said Katie Holmes yet because I just said great cast. Fuck Katie Holmes. I think that blame rests squarely on the shoulders of one David Goyer. Goyer was the uh, screenwriter for Batman Begins, and that I think is why Batman Begins sucks ass because David Goyer is a shitty screenwriter. The real problem with Batman Begins and with Goyer's script for Batman Begins is that for the first act of the movie, it plays like an extended preview for a much better movie. And then from the point where Bruce Wayne returns to Gotham City and puts on the Batman suit on through to the end, it becomes what my friend Jason Jarman, a, a reviewer for HD Room, refers to as action schlock. Why is it that Driving on Rooftops was stupid when Joel Schumacher did it, but all the fucking comic nerds came in their fucking pants when Christopher Nolan and David Goyer did it in Batman Begins? It's just as stupid. It's just as bad of an idea. And it plays just as bad. Nolan takes his characterization of Batman largely from the comics. Batman is a hero with a certain ethical code, a certain uh, sense of morality. He has rules that he will not break. He doesn't want to kill the bad guys. He just wants to apprehend them and turn them in, right? Then why does Batman recklessly endanger the lives of dozens of not just criminals, but police officers? In that, that car chase that ends with him screaming, Rachel! At Katie Holmes and jumping through the waterfall to save her fucking ass life. The only reason any of those cops that were involved in those accidents that Batman deliberately caused in Batman Begins survived was sheer dumb luck. It was like the scenes in, they would have in Batman the Animated Series where like Batman would throw a guy off of a fucking airplane and the guy would just happen to land safely in a tree or in a swimming pool on someone's rooftop penthouse and then they would surface to let us know that they weren't dead. Don't worry kids, they aren't dead. That's the level of, of sophistication in this screenplay where we're gonna say, okay, uh, Batman is going to be a moral character. He's going to consciously decide not to kill people in the pursuit of his war on crime, but 
we want to have this really cool action scene where the Batmobile is being chased by cop cars and Batman is just going to fucking blow up a bunch of these cars and intentionally cause them to wreck and crash into each other. But it's okay because as chance would have it, nobody was killed. It's just ridiculous. It's so sloppy and dumb. Even that first act, which is the best part, is frustrating. Because the best scenes in that, that first act that lead up to Bruce coming back to Gotham and, and taking up the, the Batman mantle, the best scenes in that are scenes that feel like scenes from trailers. Like there's a, there's a, what feels like it might have been a great scene between Bruce and the man he thinks is Ducard, who is actually uh, Ra's al Ghul, Liam Neeson, uh, if it had been allowed to be a scene uh, when they're, they're, they're fighting each other on that frozen lake and uh, Liam Neeson is sort of lecturing him and teaching him and he's telling him all this shit about his father and uh, they're going back and forth. And the problem is it's not a scene. It keeps being interrupted. They're, they're, it's, it's part of a montage. They keep cutting back and forth to uh, Bruce in the, in the pagoda, you know, being taught about the, the farmer who stole and murdered and became a criminal, and uh, the, how to become a ninja, you know, using the explosive powder and the, the, the theatricality and the deception. I mean, all this stuff is so compressed and crammed together because you gotta get it all out in the first act. You gotta get him into Gotham. You gotta get him into the bat suit because people wanna see him be Batman. It seems like it would have been so much better if they would have just taken that first half hour of the film and just made that the whole movie and you can have you can have scenes instead of montages made up of bits of scenes imagine that what a concept a movie with actual scenes that begin and end and have meaning and have uh context and have a unity and they aren't constantly being interrupted by cuts to other scenes because you've just got to get all of this information all of this development onto the screen as quickly as possible so you can get him back to fucking gotham city and get him to dress up in the fucking batman costume the moment when the movie just takes an irreversible nosedive is when this nameless corporate flunky walks into an empty boardroom that for some reason is populated only by Mr. Earl, the CEO of Wayne Enterprises in the absence of Bruce Wayne, to inform him uh, with no setup whatsoever, with no context, that this magic Star Trek sci-fi weapon that uh, Wayne Enterprises has manufactured, this microwave emitter, that vaporizes water supplies in their pipes and explodes them to to uh, destroy the water supply for enemy populations of militaries has been stolen from a ship at sea. It's like the uh, the blackboard scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark without Harrison Ford and without the blackboard. Uh, it's just pure plot exposition. It turns out that the microwave emitter was stolen by Ra's al Ghul's outfit, the League of Shadows, the name of which is a not very clever combination of League of Assassins, which was the name of Ra's al Ghul's organization in the comics in the 1970s, and the Society of Shadows, which was the name of Ra's al Ghul's organization in Batman the Overrated series, animated series. And uh, he, they're going to use this microwave emitter to uh, disperse a fear toxin created by uh, the Scarecrow, played by uh, Killian Murphy, who's one of the bright spots in the movie. He really is really good and really funny. It looks like he's having a good time. It looks like he senses how stupid it is when, when, he get, when the movie gets to the Batman stuff. Uh, they're going to disperse Scarecrow's fear toxin into the Gotham water supply, and then they're going to release it into the air by exploding the water supply in the pipes using the microwave emitter by placing the microwave emitter on a train that just so happens to run exactly parallel to the city's water mains because the train and the water mains are all routed through Wayne Tower, and this was done intentionally by Bruce Wayne's father, Thomas Wayne, who despite apparently being a megalomaniac who wanted the entire city to revolve around his corporate headquarters by having the public train system and the water main system routed right through his corporate headquarters, was also a really honest and modest and good guy. I can't tell you how happy I was to see that the Dark Knight had totally disposed of that idiotic train, the Plot Express, as I call it. Because that train only exists for the sole purpose of enabling this mindless, idiotic action sequence at the end, where Batman 
is fighting with Ra's al Ghul on the train and Commissioner Gordon in order to stop the microwave emitter, which is on the train, from reaching Wayne Tower and blowing up all the water mains all over the city is driving the Batmobile and trying to blow up the train bridge so that the train will not reach Wayne Tower. Now, why is it good to portray Jim Gordon for most of the movie as like Gotham's only honest cop and then suddenly turn him into Batman's little buddy in the last act of the film? I don't know why that's a good writing decision. And also, why doesn't Batman just turn the fucking microwave weapon off? Is that really finely crafted screenwriting? He like he says, hey, Commissioner Gordon, or not yet Commissioner Gordon, uh, Lieutenant Gordon. Hey, here's the keys to the Batmobile. Drive to right before Wayne Tower and blow up the bridge so the train doesn't get there because we can't let the microwave emitter reach the, the water hub and blow up all the water. Why is that the best solution? Why doesn't Batman just go, oh, hang on a second, Rachel Ghoul. Psh, oh, let me just turn this off. Oh, there we go. Problem solved. It's a plot that relies on its characters' brains turning to mush at the absolute perfect time. That's the only way the story advances, if, is if the characters are dumb enough to allow things to move ahead in the direction that the writers decide it, it's supposed to go. It's a terribly written film. Most of the good stuff, what little there is, what very little there is of the good stuff in the Batman portion of the movie, is the stuff that is lifted from uh, Batman Year One. Uh, overall, though, a, a fucking terrible movie. Uh, really, really overrated, fucking terrible movie. But it would get a lot better after Batman Begins because Christopher Nolan and Christian Bale and Morgan Freeman and Michael Caine would be back with Gary Oldman. Thankfully, Katie Holmes would be turned into Maggie Gyllenhaal. They would add themselves an Aaron Eckhart. They would add themselves a Heath Ledger. And they'd make something finally at last, after all these tries that we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks on this YouTube channel of mine, all those Batman movies, finally they would make something that was really special. And I'm going to talk about that one in the next video, The Dark Knight.